Good morning, everybody. It's really great to be able to speak to you today on this World Animal Day. This is the first time we are celebrating this here at SPSJ, but it will not certainly be the last. And it's starting uh, what we're calling Climate Week, where we are thinking deliberately throughout this week, uh, up until Harvest Sunday next Sunday, uh, about the climate, about the environment. We know from all the press and everything that there's uh, this huge issue right now. And so we want to set aside a week every single year where we deliberately just focus in on it again and uh, just challenge ourselves and reassess, almost like a kind of MOT opportunity every year to, to, to look at this issue together. Um, some of you may not realise about me why I'm particularly keen to do something like this today is as a child growing up, my ambition was to own my own zoo. I loved going around zoos. I loved looking at them and uh, my parents always thought it was slightly strange that I wouldn't just take pictures of the animals, I would take pictures of the enclosures as well and kind of imagine uh, how I would redesign it, what I would do differently uh, with it to, to the hope of one day having my own zoo. Now, of course, uh, I decided not to, to go down that line eventually, and here I am as a church leader. So I leave it up for others to decide whether I was successful or not in my childhood ambitions. Uh, what I would say, though, is there are a lot of similarities. Uh, I still have to be quite financially responsible for buildings. Uh, I have to manage people. Uh, I have to have pastoral care and oversight. Uh, there's a lot of similarities in what I do now to uh, maybe what I was wanting to do as a child. And I still love animals. Uh, in fact, my first degree back in the late 90s was in business and environmental management. And in those days, there wasn't a lot of jobs uh, working in that kind of field. Uh, some of the friends that I had who went into it said they would just sit in an office really and not do anything. And occasionally someone would come in and ask them, well, what's the policy on this and what can I do? But it, we have come a long, long way over these last 15, 20 years, which is fantastic. But there is still a long way to go over the next 15, 20 years. And so I want to talk not from a kind of um, an environmental or uh, a climate emergency viewpoint. I want to speak to you today on this issue from purely a Christian and biblical viewpoint in what our response needs to be. The first point I want to make simply is we have to, in everything in life, learn to see things the way God sees them. Now, whether that's other people, whether that's our work situation, whether that's something that's troubling us, or whether that's the world that we live in, we've got to learn to see things the way that God sees them. Uh, perhaps Albert Einstein, ironically, is someone who can explain this well. He's quoted as saying, a human being is a part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feeling as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison, by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Albert Einstein is saying there that we can get just caught up basically in ourselves and our own agendas, what we see, and we just huddle around those who are closest to us. Does that sound familiar, I wonder? Now what I would say is how we get out of that as Christians is that is why it's so important to have this relationship with God, because God is outside of time and space, unlike us. So when we learn to see things through God's eyes, we're learning to see things outside of time and space. And we begin to trust in this bigger picture of what is going on. And that's why it's so crucial that we do that. World Animal Day uh, started originally uh, on this 4th of October, it's always been this day, and it was deliberately aligned to St. Francis of Assisi, because this, the Sunday, the 4th of October, is the day that we remember and celebrate St. Francis. Now, uh, what is St. Francis Day? Well, there's over 10,000 saints recognised by the Roman Catholic Church, and the most popular or significant of those saints, those saints are given their own feast day, so a particular Sunday where they are remembered. And St. Francis, as I say, takes place on the 4th of October. 
on this day uh, we kind of remember St. Francis and who he was and what he did. He was this 12th century uh, saint who was uh, born in Assisi and he uh, had this kind of love of animals and the environment. And so the way that people would celebrate them traditionally is with prayer. They might donate food uh, that's collected up in church. We're going to be doing that next Sunday as part of our harvest. And in some cases as well, uh, church services will be held to bless pets. Uh, obviously, we can't do that this year. Um, but who knows? Maybe next year. I'm sure some of you would love that. I know Claire would. Um, St. Francis, he was this patron saint of animals and ecology. As I say, he was born in Assisi back in 1181. He's the son of a wealthy silk merchant and he lived this popular and rich lifestyle. And Francis decided to enlist in the army as a young man, but he didn't last long in that because he was captured and held prisoner for a year. But once he was released, he just returned back to his indulgent lifestyle that he had. But then he got ill and that illness made him question his life. And as such, he decided to embark on his pilgrimage to Rome. And there he witnessed a great deal of poverty. And he really began to kind of think about this, so different to the lifestyle he knew. So he returns home a changed man. His lifestyle choices, including dressing more modestly and donating silk to the poor. And from on, here onwards, Francis decides deliberately to leave his former life behind, live a life following God and lived as a beggar in Assisi, repairing ruined churches. He travels across Europe and the Middle East, trying to spread the word of God, this thing that had just radically changed his life. He's known for his love of animals, the famous pictures you might have seen of him. He's called, he called animals like his fellow brothers and sisters. He loved every living creature that God had made. St. Francis believed that nature was a reflection of God. And while preaching, birds are said to have gathered around him. And many of the miracles are said to have been done through St. Francis, including healing the sick, saving people from shipwrecks and restoring the sight of the blind. He's a wonderful example to us of someone who learned to see the world the way God sees it. He got out of his own little prison, out of his own little existence, and he saw things through God's eyes. But then the key to St. Francis, which we need to remember today, which is, brings on to our second point, is he didn't just see it, he then acted on what he had seen. So for this second point of the sermon, I brought you outside to appreciate this beautiful countryside that we have here in Hereford. And I want to introduce you to my pet. This is Tamarin. Uh, I've, uh, uh, we've had Tamarin now for 13 years, so she's getting on a little bit. And, um, and she's just been a beautiful dog to us and, and really loyal and obedient and faithful. And she's been a wonderful companion to us over these last 13 years. But I kind of liken how we are to follow God a little bit like a dog is to their owner. You see, a dog always has a choice to make. The owner will give a dog a command, but it's up to the dog if they choose to listen and if they do listen and hear it, whether they choose to obey it. Now, the love I have for Tamarin, our dog, is exactly the same. Whilst I may be a bit frustrated if she chooses to ignore me, I still love her. And she can only receive the benefit of that love, though, if she listens, if she hears, and then does, acts upon what she hears. And that's the same for us with God. You see, God gives us clear guidance and instructions throughout the Bible. God speaks to us still today. But if we don't listen, then it's very difficult for us to receive the love that God has for us. If we want to receive the fullness of the love that God has, we need to listen, we need to uh, hear what God is saying to us, and then we need to respond. We need to come to God and act on what we've heard to receive the full benefit of that love. Jesus does this with Peter doesn't he? After his resurrection he's on the beach and we have another miraculous catch of fish and then Jesus is there already prepared the barbecue for them on the beach and he's talking to Peter as they're about to eat and he says Peter do you love me? And Peter replies of course I love you Lord and he says so go and feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. If you love me, then you will do this. 
This is the clear command of Jesus. Don't just say it, it's not just about words, it's about actions as well. In a couple of weeks time on our Sunday services we're going to be looking through the letter of James and in the letter of James you see these words it says what good is it my brothers and sisters if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds can such faith save them suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food if one of you says to them go in peace keep warm and well fed but does nothing about their physical needs what good is it in the same way faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action is dead. John Stott, a modern day theologian, said that God intends our care of the creation to reflect our love for the Creator. We must respond to this beautiful world that God has given to us. We must act on how God has told us to take care of it, to nurture it, to love it. We can't ignore that. It's no good just saying that we love God, we must show it through our actions. And that includes how we treat this world that God created. Now I'm not saying this is an easy change, because we've all developed so many patterns of the way we live our lives. And it goes against some of the grain of how our culture and society has evolved. So it takes time, and it requires education. That's the whole point of the Eco Church movement that, and why we're doing this week. Because it's part of our teaching series throughout the year that we spend this time looking about the issue of the climate and the environment that we live in. And I'm delighted that St Peter's has already received a bronze award uh, as part of this process and journey that we are on. But it requires a kind of education for all of us individually as well, to start to change how we operate, to change the way we think, to change our mindset, so we don't just go for the cheapest option, for example. I mean, we've started now checking in shops if something contains palm oil, not just going, oh, that's the cheapest, we'll have that. It's the cheapest because it contains palm oil, which is cheaper to produce, but the environmental damage that that causes is far greater than the extra 30p I might have to pay for something else. It's all about education and changing those little things that we can do. And if, if we continue to kind of work at it, then we begin to make an impact. We can't just rest on our laurels thinking, well, I've done my bit now, that's okay. No, we've got to keep pushing on into this. And the other thing is, I want to say, is that we shouldn't be deceived in our thinking that what we do and what we can do is just insignificant, that it won't make any difference to this global problem that we see, that that's somebody else's problem, governments, big organisations, that's what they need to do to change. No, we need to all change individually and, and realise that that can make a huge difference globally. I don't know if you've ever seen the film Evan Almighty. There's a wonderful moment in it when Evan, uh, who God asks to go and build an ark, if you've not seen it, and Evan is talking to God. And this question kind of comes to, from Evan to God, to, how do you change the world? And God replies, one single act of random kindness at a time. One single act of random kindness at a time. Obviously, act of random kindness spelling out ark there for the purpose of the film. But it's absolutely right. One little bit at a time is how you change the world. Which brings us on to our third point. Well, come back inside because I want to make sure you can hear this last point over the noise of the dairy farm and the birds and everything from my garden. And it's that what you do makes a difference. No matter how small you might think it is, when you do something and act in a deliberate way, then the world is changed. One of the rather strange upshots of uh, the coronavirus and the lockdown, if you can think back to April, was there were so many reports coming out about how animals and nature was bouncing back from the sudden, uh, the less kind of uh, people that were around and busying all the streets and the other areas. Uh, so there's certainly loads more birds again singing in our gardens. Now, there was uh, wild goats running around in Clandudno. Um, endangered seahorses returning to a stronghold that it used to have in Dorset because of fewer people and boat traffic in that area. See, small changes can make a big difference because our world is an incredible world that is able to come back again. God built an incredible world. 
Big deliberate changes, we can see whole species saved from extinction. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, verses 26 to 30, we read this. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed on it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move on the ground. Everything that has breath of life in it I give every green plant for food. And it was so. When we think about this idea of ruling over something, it can be so easy to kind of think of this in a kind of power way, that you're to control it, to subdue it, to domineer over it. These are the kind of things that pop into our head, aren't they? But actually in the context of the Bible and being a follower of Jesus, Peter describes it in his letter like this. He says, do not lord it over those entrusted to you, but be examples to the flocks. Do not lord it over those entrusted to you, but be examples to the flocks. Why? Well, because that's the example that Jesus has given to us. Now, in this context, Peter was obviously talking to church leaders, but I think the principle applies to all that God entrusts to each and every one of us. And God has entrusted this earth to us. We must be responsible in how we treat it, being an example to each other, encouraging each other, bringing healing and restoration to a hurting and broken world, bringing down the kingdom of God in all its fullness into our midst now. So let's learn. Let's learn to see things how God sees them. And when we do, let's not be afraid to act on what we see and commit to working together for the common good so that we can see our world transformed. Amen.